Welcome to this episode of Sweaty Anal Nectar. Oh. Sweaty Anal Nectar. All right. yeah. Yeah. We decided to really lean into the, the grossness uh, for this I episode. Suppose I'm, I'm okay with that, but sweaty seems the wrong S word. Well, they gave me a second have, option. If you have anal nectar, the sweat's not going to get Succulent. in there. Succulent. Sweat's on the Sweet outside. Sweet was the other option. Sweet mm. anal nectar, slimy anal nectar. I'd go with any of those, mm-hmm. but uh, sweaty anal nectar, that just doesn't make any sense. That one is courtesy of Drew Cannon on Instagram. God, God damn it, Drew. <laughs> Despite the logical inconsistency, the intention is good. Really appreciate it. Set a new record, though. That's the fastest we've ever uh, uh, made it uh, certain that CrossFit will definitely not share this episode of the podcast. Absolutely. So we did it. What was that? Like eight seconds? That's such a vibrant title. Yes. Yeah. I can taste it. Nectar. It's like stuck to the roof of my mouth. Wait. Nectar is what bees make, right? Uh, yeah. Nectar is what bees use to make honey. Yes. Used to make honey. Okay. Nectar is like nectar is like the 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 flower jizz that mm-hmm. bees guzzle and then and then turn into uh, honey, which is the bee poop. So, in mm-hmm. order to have anal nectar, does that require bees live inside your ass? Yes. That, My seems, ass. Logical. that seems logical. <laughs> ass <there>. bees. <laughs> Do you not have bees living in okay, your ass? I, okay. I imagine it's some some bizarre form of like uh, Indian torture there, where they capture someone, they stake them down with their asshole spread wide, <laughs> so that bees can form a colony inside the ass, putting the anal nectar into the ass. And of course, it's very hot outside because this is uh, in Texas, probably, yeah. and so they'd be very sweaty. So sweaty yes. anal nectar. It's we, basically an, a, a, an ancient Comanche form of torture. They use torture their various enemies. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, that uh, is decided. That that happened. Mm-hmm. I feel assaulted. <laughs> um, hashtag me too, Chase. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Uh, you guys, I, I would say let's talk about Wadapalooza, but uh, by the time that this is airing, uh. Wadapalooza will have already happened. Oh. That so shit will be over. So it was let's, great. So let's just say congratulations to Travis Williams and his team for uh, <laughs> smashing everybody and making it to the CrossFit Games. Sure. False. Uh, also, <laughs> congratulations to... Can you name anyone else competing? I can name, but no one's surprising. I can name only people who likely will. I'm trying to find an, uh, an unli- a less likely name. Mitch Barnard. Mitch Barnard, yes, Mitch Barnard, the lesser known of the Canadians. Yes, he, I, I like him because he is stockier than Brent Fikowski. Brent yes, Fikowski, I like him very much. I like his height, I like his intelligence. He's a little too skinny. You have a lot to say about this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Why? <laughs> Between the three of them, they, I mean, they are the palest, palest motherfuckers ever. Mm-hmm. Pat Vellner, Mitch Barnard, Brent yep. Fikowski. Yep. That's White Walkers. Yes. They are from north. I Maybe we should something. be building the wall on the northern <laughs> border. Speaking of White Walkers, does anyone see the Game of Thrones teaser? Yeah. Uh, over, mm-hmm. uh, I guess we all technically must have seen it. Mm. Uh, yep, yep. It almost tricks me into being excited for the final season of the show that has been completely ruined by the last yeah. couple well, seasons. My, no. my only thoughts on this is that the writing was so bad and so widely recognized as bad in the last season, and they've taken quite a bit of extra time getting this fucker together that... Perhaps, perhaps there was a little more effort, mm. as in greater than zero effort, towards making the words good in the thing. I the refuse words. to let you guys ruin Game of Thrones <laughs> for me this year. I don't care that it's it. not good. Yeah. Try being less smart. It's yeah. definitely not. Well, so many good. things are more entertaining when you're not a smart guy. That's the problem. That's the problem. Is that that's the problem with the the thing? Is that I wish I w- if if. If, if 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 take a Morty approach. If in if they'd taken a more simplified or pulpier, like for instance, let's look at a for instance here. Let's look at something like Breaking Bad, which is a very smart show, and some people complain that the ending of Breaking Bad was a bit too pulpy and 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 kind of dumb. I disagree. I think that the ending was a perfect extension of what the show had been up to that point, and it it it's the only way it could have ended, which is Walt using his ingenuity to get out of an impossible situation, kill a bunch of motherfuckers. Great. The problem is, my whole thing is the type of storytelling that was at work at the last season of Game of Thrones and probably in the last, last season of Game of Thrones that is, you know, forthcoming just won't be the same show. You know, it won't be about of course inverting and subverting expectations of how this story would play out. It's just going to be about delivering you all the juice. And you even see that 
in that 60 second teaser because the 60 second teaser shows uh what's her name redheaded bitch um mm, sansa. Sansa. sansa uh handing over the cat handing over winterfell to daenerys and i'm like Cool, mm-hmm. but that makes things way too oh, easy. Yeah, I didn't that, see that. Like, yeah, I didn't like see that. that teaser at all. Actually, I saw a different. Oh, teaser. you saw a, just saw a different one. Yeah, <laughs> there's just it's really near the end. It's really near the end. It's just Daenerys just says the Winterfell, Winterfell is yours, your yeah. grace, and I Daenerys sound is like that. There. God, that's so she, she, didn't, she didn't sound like two adult men saying I can't, it simultaneously. I, I, I can't uh, listen. I'll watch it yep. because we're basically getting what is it like seven or eight episodes this last yeah, yeah. season, and each one has like the budget yep. of like a, a '90s action movie. Yep. So mm-hmm. I will happily watch. Uh, yeah. You know, so they spent like what 150 million dollars on this last season, something oh, like sure. that. Well, that's that cool, be, man. it's a perfect. Great. I'm just saying, it's a perfect example. Special effects, just like the John Snow Daenerys thing. You know, just like rather than the Game of Thrones way of telling that story, which is they're put at odds with one another and they would have hated each other and tried to kill each other. And then through some convoluted way, they eventually get to the point where they really earn their their initially tentative ally-ness. And then that eventually develops into love, etc. It's like they met each other. They hit they hit it off right away, you guys. Yeah, they hit it, it off was right away. It was, it was a little meet cute. And then the, and it looks like, and then we're like, okay, but we still got a bunch of different potential you know, kingdoms here. You got Winterfell over here. You got Daenerys. Oh, it turns out Sansa and Daenerys, they're going to meet. They're going to be friends. In fact, it's honestly such a non-issue in this season. We're going to put it in the first 60-second teaser so, for so the season. So worked up by this teaser. I know. What, um, if that, what if that comes moments before in the first episode, the White Walkers make it over and they kill everybody? And then the, the rest of the season is just the White Walker adventures. I would be thrilled. Are you talking about expectations being yes. subverted, Chase? Yes. Yeah. Wouldn't that be mm. dope? That is the one thing that All ain't right, going to happen. Like Winterfell's the yours. Walkers, didn't matter. Come over the wall. Mm-hmm. They're about to kill Daenerys, and they sink her mm-hmm. ship in the harbor, and she sprouts dragon wings and flies okay. through the frozen waters mm-hmm. back to the yes. safety, only to spend the rest of the season in a coma, uh-huh. and then yes. show up at the very end. Ooh, I got a better. I'll do one better. I'll do one better. Luke so her Skywalker. ship, her ship sinks. She goes down. She's definitely God dead. She gets stabbed. By a traitor, ship burns, she goes down with it, she's at the bottom of the ocean. Whole war plays out, we get to the end of the season, you know, uh, Cersei or somebody gets get, becomes queen, I don't give a shit. Last shot, pushes into the water, you go underground, and then at the in the ocean, there's a fucking human-sized dragon egg just pulsing down there, and then boom, Daenerys' hand, fist <laughs> pops out of it. Cut to black. End of series. Mm. Oh, okay. Or she she gets killed early on. Uh-huh. They end up beating the Night King, mm-hmm. and then at the end, it's the Night Queen, mm-hmm. and there is your song of yeah. fire and ice. So just yeah. hang that up there for another couple thousand years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I see. I see a bet. Well, yeah. I see. Here's my prediction for how it'll turn out. Honestly, in terms of subversion of expectations, is that. Daenerys will be at Winterfell. She'll be accepted into Winterfell. All the ever the characters we're mostly familiar with will all be on the same side, fighting the White Walkers. But they have an ice dragon with them, and so <laughs> they'll all get killed in the first skirmish. And that deep pull, as it turns out, the real hero of the series mm-hmm. the whole way through. You need to watch the whole series again to figure it out. Is Hot Pie. The fat kid, <laughs> the fat kid that Ari befriended when she yes. was pretending to be a boy on the journey up, who's left that little diner there. As it turns out, the secret to defeating the White Walkers is a special recipe for hot pies that yep. he had been working on that whole time. Yep. And that, as it turns out, all the stuff with the dragons and the armies and all that, irrelevant. Now we're also, cooking. Games of Thrones. Yes. Has nothing to do with w- the victory at all. Scones, you know what I mean? No, it yeah. was all it was all Everybody based on eat. that one fat kid who was absent from the majority of the seasons. Yeah, but the moments he did show up. But then, in order, really to, but then in order to mobilize their forces against the White Walkers, they have to make a lot of pies, and so um, they uh, form an, a rudimentary conveyor belt to, uh, for an assembly line, and then it just turns into like an I Love Lucy situation where the pies just keep coming and they're trying to make the pies, and it's all just slapstick comedy after that. Oh, I got one. I think John and the Night King mm-hmm. end up in a one-on-one duel with mm-hmm. their armies surrounding them mm-hmm. and dramatically waiting to mm-hmm. see which one of them ends up the victor, mm-hmm. and John calls upon the power of being both a Targaryen and a Stark mm. and summons uh, the sword of Azor Delai or whatever out of 
the the spirits of the stars and then stabs the night king in the chest and the night king says you should have been through the head (laughs) and then swipes his hand and and everyone turns into a zombie and that's the end of it right yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, i like that until until game of thrones end game end game of thrones so no i'll do you one better i'll do you one better pull it off honestly i wouldn't i'd be like shit i'm seeing it no i can do you one better though uh what we have is a situation where Daenerys comes to Winterfell, uh, mm-hmm. where she meets um, a Sansa Stark, and then they just uh, and then they then they scissor each other. <laughs> you saw it coming. <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> they, I thought, they I thought you were going to use a different. Oh phrase. yes, I, I I considered it, and then they just <laughs> then they just mash their vaginas together. <laughs> it's just that bloodline meets that bloodline. They have to instantly. That bone. is the song of yes, Fire and Ice. That's right. right just red and platinum blonde pubic hair yes. getting all sticky yes. and mixed together. Pla- yes. platinum blonde pubic hair. It's a full all treatment. That sweaty <laughs> anal nectar. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's a full dye treatment. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, anyway, thorough. Song of Fire and Ice, right uh, there. So that wasn't the only trailer, by the way, yep. that came out mm. this 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 entire this weekend. Which, by the way, this entire episode is going to be about media. We're not going to talk about yeah. CrossFit at all. Uh, but you guys are departing for Wadapalooza tomorrow. Yeah, as, yeah. as of this recording. Chase and I are leaving for Wadapalooza in less than twelve hours, so God very, bless. very early yes. in the morning. So lots of lots I of be asleep now. Yes, lots of lots lots of fitness content forthcoming is the point that yes. I'm going to make. So uh, now we can focus a hundred percent on non-fitness related yeah. stuff. Hell yeah. Oh, there were three new sanction events announced. Yeah, who cares though? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. You, wait, what? I don't know about this. Yeah, no. Of course, they haven't been announced yet. Like in real time, but by the time oh, this comes shit. out, so you can give us the scoop. So you guys were supposed to just play along and be like, "Oh yeah, that's super oh, cool." And okay. then, well, see, yeah, this is duh. another thing where we got to cl- more clearly establish when we're entering one of these improv games because I'm just <laughs> reacting as if this is yes, all new for yeah, all of these things. I'm like, "Oh, okay, cool." Uh, yeah. So super secret information that I, that is under embargo that yeah. I'm sharing with you guys right now against yeah. the law is that there are three new sanction events: one mm-hmm. in Ireland and two in Canada. Hey. Ireland hey. has gone. Finally, two in Canada. Two. Okay, all both problems large solved. game, both large competitions, large gay yeah. competitions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is it like are they bi- bi- coastal in Canada? Yeah, that's okay. one is in Quebec Buy something. and one Ayo. is in Vancouver. Oh man, one, I know one of the events, one of the Canadian things it'll be is you know uh, at uh, 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 curling at, at lumber yards there when they have mm. all the cut down trees floating down the river. Yeah, be running over the top of a bunch of those, trying not to fall down the middle and be trapped and drown and die. <laughs> like insomnia, directed yeah. by Christopher Nolan. Never seen God. it. Yep. Whatever. Oh shit! I forgot that was in there. Yeah, and there was some action movie from the '80s. I'm aware of some cop thing where, yeah, part of the action with the bad guy at the end was yeah running across those, and the bad guy like fell between them, and they closed, and he got trapped and died. Oh, Isn't cool. that a scene in uh-huh. Bloodsport when John claude Van Damme is running away from like Forrest Whitaker, and he runs across like little boats, or was that a different uh, movie? That, 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 that's, that's in Bloodsport for that's sure. That's in Bloodsport, Blood but not the logs, not the yeah, logs not, up not in the logs. up in the either Pacific Northwest or Canada, which are just sort of one. Boats are the Asian mm-hmm. equivalent of logs. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. So anyway, <laughs> let's go ahead and talk trailers before we j- get into True Detective. Uh, you, you didn't see Spider Man, right? I did. Which, you did. I wait. No, oh, that's a trailer. Oh no, no, Spider Man that no, we I discussed. Didn't, I didn't watch. Yeah, I didn't watch Spider Verse. Spider Verse. You Spider-verse. are missing. I was going out. to watch it. Uh, Chase and I were going to go catch it, um, but we we couldn't make it. But the universe is ready with a whole new Spider Man film for you. Right. Damn right. Soon In enough. case you're wondering, Spider Man somehow makes it through the snap. Yes. And has shenanigans yeah. filled adventures with Nick Fury, who yes. also makes it through the snap. Uh-huh. Yep, yep, yep. Unless we, this is some we, sort of prequel. Yeah, do we know that? Well, that's the thing is that what's interesting is that now we finally have the trailer for Spider Man. Two out Spider Man Far, Far From, from home. home, the sequel to Homecoming, featuring Spider Man, Peter Parker, played by Tom Holland, and Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury, both of whom are supposed to be dead in the Marvel universe. So I guess Marvel has finally decided that they can't that they just gotta get this shit out here and they can't yeah. wait for Infinity War to reveal it. It would have been cool if at least like there had been some sort of like in the first Infinity War teaser, like the tease at the end was like seeing one shot of like an alive Spider Man or Nick Fury just to kind of open the world up and let you know, but whatever. I, th- anyway, the trailer is good, though. The trailer's really so, good, and mm-hmm. uh, Jake Gyllenhaal looks like a fucking awesome Mysterio. <laughs> yes, and much to my surprise, he looks like Mysterio. I guess why should I be surprised? It's a Marvel movie, but he just full-on orb head and like cape and the whole thing, and it appears yeah. to be setting up a dynamic whereby uh, he, that uh, 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 Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio is creating phantom 
bad guys so that he can position himself as a superhero versus a mm. supervillain. Just like Syndrome ah, in The yes. Incredibles. Uh, Except instead of using zero point technology, he uses magic. Yes, because in... Um, Magic's way more dope. Yes, yeah, magic is pretty cool. Because, yeah, Mysterio is uh, all about illusions and whatnot. So. Yeah, he's fighting these like giant elemental creature looking Yeah, I'm things. wondering if in some way the uh, big guy made of water, big guy made of rock that we see in the trailer is somehow going to be referred to or as an interpretation of the Spider-Man villain Absorbing Man. Yeah, I was thinking Absorbing Man. I remember yeah. that card. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Was uh-huh. he really a Spider-Man villain? I don't fucking he was, remember. He was what, we had, the, we had the, the trading card there That's of true. Absorbing Man. There, I remember Where that. he was grabbing like bricks with one hand or no his hand was on bricks and his hand turned to bricks and his other hand was grabbing fucking iron it was turned to yeah. iron it was all badass and cool yeah, yeah, yeah. so something like that <laughs> that is a really whack superpower yeah. that is a whack depending, superpower depending on its like when he's jerking it does his arm turn into a dick it <laughs> does it does ah, <laughs> no yeah. he turns into a big dick this is gay now <laughs> No, it's just his entire body <laughs> becomes dick as drug my dick. his entire body becomes as sensitive as the end of a penis. <laughs> it's just all it's just <laughs> all tip skin, the whole body. Nice, it's very sensitive. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so now we can consider a little bit more about this superpower. Yeah, yeah. I feel mm-hmm. I feel like uh, Spider Verse ruined me on on Tom Holland Spider Man though. Yeah, I, know. I I just want. Mm. I just want that, oh, you that saw Spider-Man. Oh, yeah, you saw you saw yeah, yeah. So did you enjoy it, Chase? Yeah, it was super sick. It was pretty sick, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Mm-hmm. God, I feel more attached to that kid. Yeah, well, I think that any superhero. Good, yeah, I think it's a good way that staking out the Miles Morales slash kind of weird multiverse territory is a good mm-hmm. way to have that animated universe kind of exist independently yeah. on its own for a while, as opposed to going to Marvel for the you know white hetero patriarchal Spider Man of all <laughs> yeah. days. Sis, sis, sis. Um, uh-huh. The other thing is that what's kind of interesting is that the because the the Tom Holland Spider Man was kind of a hybrid of Peter Parker and Miles Morales because the entire plot in uh, Homecoming where he has like the chubby Asian roommate friend who is his like point man, his like man in the chair the thing. Oracle, yeah, the yeah, man in the chair. Yeah, yeah, that is from the Miles Morales comic book. Hmm. So if you even notice, he's in the movie, at least the, oh, the yeah, Miles yeah, Morales sure. version. His, he has the roommate and then who at the end, he's like, I finally met my, in the closing, anyway, yeah, you know, not to roommate. spoil anything for Armin, but oh, he's like, I, I finally met my that? roommate. Yeah. I forgot that. Yeah, he's the, did, yeah. did I not see that? I maybe never saw the end tag on Spider-Man. It's, it's in. The, it's not in the tag. It's in just the. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's at it's the very end of the movie. So finally found my new roommate, and the roommate is Miles Morales. No, the, oh, no, 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 no. In in oh. Spider-Man <laughs> Into the Spider Verse, yeah. there's and himself. He oh, has a roommate okay. yeah. who is a, the Asian kid from the comic books. Right. The Asian kid from the comic finally books is the same right. one. Okay. Is the same one who is in the Tom Holland Spider-Man movie, mm-hmm. portrayed by that kid who is also Asian in that film. Um, and so that is a feature of the Miles Morales comic book that they brought into the uh, Spider-Man Homecoming thing. So, there you go. Mm-hmm. So, now you guys know shit. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Learned something new. They yeah. Out the, and, uh, you know, fucking watch the watch the Spider-Verse yeah. movie. Like, mm-hmm. I, I should. Just do it. I still yeah. haven't even watched Venom. I should watch oh, Venom. No, you shouldn't. No. You should do Spider-Verse. Oh, you, it's like, Venom why, will be there. Why would you watch Venom? It doesn't make know. any sense. Tom Hardy's in it? Yeah. Fuck. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's it. There is reason to see movies that ahead of time you know are bad. And that is if you know that you're going to be drunk or something when you watch it. Yes. So plan for that if you want to watch Venom. Just work that in. That's my secret. I'm always drunk. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) I get it. Uh, it's like the Hulk is always angry. You can watch any movie you want anytime. Check out this. Speaking of Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh, I was going <laughs> to do that. I was going to There's another Jake Gyllenhaal segue. movie. Yeah. Velvet Buzzsaw, Velvet dude. Buzzsaw. I didn't see it. I didn't watch the trailer. Yo, that trailer yeah. is you provide fucking bananas. Yes. I love Jake Gyllenhaal, yeah. man. From, uh, from the Nightcrawler team. It's amazing. Who, who, who very kind of beneath the radar, he made a second movie after Nightcrawler starring... Denzel Washington, which came and went, and, and what movie and was that? It was called um, Israel something or other, where uh, where Denzel Washington played like a lawyer, and what the you know, or, gonna have? Oh, yeah, yeah I don't remember. Right. Does exact- it kill people in it? I mean, he was like playing an eccentric character. Like he had weird hair and glasses, and was like a weird dude. And it was this whole movie that came out like last year and just what? went nowhere. <laughs> Holy yeah, shit. it really, it really went. I mean, I think Denzel Washington got some nominations because he was Denzel Washington, but like for <laughs> like uh, you know, like a Golden Globe or something. 
Um, but uh, yeah, but now he's back with his what everyone's calling the follow up to Nightcrawler because now Jake Gyllenhaal and people give a shit. Uh, and I was very surprised to see that it appears to be a full-on horror movie. So Yeah, it's very strange. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea what I, I was going into. And I just happened to catch the trailer mm-hmm. on Netflix because Netflix has the, the distribution rights, I guess. Mm-hmm. Oh, and shit. So it's Netflix going to come directly to Netflix? February yeah. 1st. So it's not even a couple uh, weeks. Yeah. So it's popping, yeah, the player. trailer's popping up. And the trailer is really kind of weird and out yeah. there. And it takes this crazy turn in the middle where like paintings start like start mm-hmm. coming to life to kill people seems it's to be awesome a, seems to be a haunted painting movie slash psychological thriller where of course we will be asked to question whether or not the, the painting things are real or if they're all in Jake Gyllenhaal's head and Jake Gyllenhaal is actually the one who's killing people or something yeah. like that but and still. it's also it seems really funny yes and it seems like a the the entire the entire group of people that are being sort of victimized in mm-hmm. this movie are all art critics and yeah, putting yeah. on an art show yeah, like yeah. Uh, and so, we're fine with seeing all them die. Of yeah. course, a barrel of laughs. And so, that, plus we that, know Tony Collette is fucked because she dies in the goddamn right in, trailer. Right in the trailer. The movie. There's not a, a spoiler. There's a great uh, the, the subtext of uh, of do we really need critics is 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 pretty wonderful. <laughs> in that, oh, I like that. A lot. Yeah. So the Velvet Buzzsaw trailer is fantastic. And Velvet or violent? Velvet. 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 Mm-hmm. Sick. Uh, and then speaking of trailers, and this one is of a movie that I will never ever watch, not in a million oh. fucking years. Is uh, the trailer for us? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Watched that Wait. last night. Us? Oh, you mean the, the, the new Jordan Peele Jordan, movie? Jordan Peele yep, movie. Yep, yep, yep. Watched, oh, no, watched oh, the trailer sure. last night, and it terrified I the fuck out of us. Me. The Netflix series everybody's been watching. Oh, no, it's you. That's. You, Shit, wait, man. Yeah, Vows are hard, I'm first yeah, yeah. and foremost. No, people haven't us. been talking about you. That's, that, cool. was on, that was honestly the first thing I thought of when he said us. I was like, I thought it was called you. Thank God he had um, my back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the Jordan Peele, the trailer for that. that Not a strong movie. title. Two mo- Great filmmaker, but two two movies in a row. Not strong title. Get Out. Not a, like I get it. Like I get that Get Out's the title because that was that thing that was in that one Eddie Murphy stand up that one time. It was about similar stuff, but not not a strong title. You don't immediately think of that. Movie. Yeah, I like that movie a lot, movie. And, I, and, I, and I, it's hard for me to remember the title. Yeah. Have you seen see, the Have you go. seen the trailer for Us? I don't think so I. So the entire yeah. the entire thing uses uh, Luniz's hit single. Oh, from I got the five. 90s. Yo, I so got I have seen it, it, and it has the it makes that song super terrifying. It makes that song super terrifying. It's super slow. Luniz, uh, I got five on it. I, yeah, I don't know what that is. Is that a new song? No, it's old. It's from the nineties. Oh, okay. Interesting. It's dope, but it's not about drugs. Oh, Don't do right, drugs. Right, because there's a whole thing. Culture. Right, I forgot how the trailer. It's been. I only watched the trailer once when it first came out. There's some sort of thing where yeah, they're like singing a song in yeah, the yeah. car, and that becomes the song. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I, get it, I get it. I get it. I get it. Uh, yeah, that that trailer scared the shit out of me, oh, and good. I don't ever want to watch that movie. So <laughs> I, I have this thing. It. I told Katie about this a long time ago, and I feel like there's probably other people who are mm-hmm. watching and listening right now who feel the same way. And so I'm going to bare my soul here. Mm-hmm. I really love the idea of horror movies. Mm-hmm. But I don't like watching horror movies. Mm-hmm. I like just just watching the trailer for horror movies mm-hmm. and getting that like endorphin hit, <laughs> and then I'll just like read the script Fuck and like figure you. out what happens and Fuck. just like I'll, I'll yeah. go, so lame. Um, that's yeah. my you. just keep that that's to my, yourself. I'm just that's gonna just never tell me that again. Putting myself out there on that one, mm-hmm. I really appreciate. Like for example, yes, uh, I was browsing Reddit the other day and someone uh, put up this this video and it was like this scene is fucking crazy, mm-hmm. really, really really horrifying. And I was like, yeah. I wonder what this is. And it was a scene from Suspiria, yeah. the new one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's a scene where some chick is, it seems like she's getting punished or something, but uh, mm-hmm. she like gets thrown into like uh, one of the dance studios. That's the like mirror all, room. The mirror yeah, room, the mirror room yeah. sequence. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the mirror room sequence, sure. And uh, holy <laughs> fuck. Suck my dick, but That yes. was awesome. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I guess that makes sense. That yeah, makes yeah. sense. That's, what, that's why yeah, it's yeah. called. It was fucking awesome. Yeah. And I was like, well, yeah. I've gotten everything I need to get out of this movie. I don't uh, think I need to watch no, this. No, no, you haven't, so you haven't even more. seen no, 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 a little bit. You haven't no, no, seen a it's good. I've gotten the taste. You've gotten the taste. It's, no, no. it's good. I got exactly yeah. what oh, I wanted. No. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to, trust me, that, that's that's worth taking the plunge. There are things that I won't, that like I will watch out of more of a sense of duty to just like, I need to get it into my brain. And I will like I'll like if if I know something is going to be like gritty, torturous violence, especially like when it's like an art film like this year's um, 
uh, what was the dance movie? Uh, Guess Spartan? Oh, the, the uh, Climax. No, the other Climax, one. the other dance movie. That oh, was, my God. It's a slightly <laughs> better dance movie. So, like, Climax yes. or, like, House That Jack Built, mm. I kind of went into where it's like, all right, got to do this. And often I'm just very pleasantly surprised when I do that, that the things turn out great, yada, yada, yada. But when it comes to stuff like horror movies, if there's witches and shit in it and, like, spells and things, like, nothing, there's nothing in that movie that's going to provoke, scary. that's going to, like, really make you genuinely uncomfortable. It's going to cause people to walk out of the theater or anything like that. Well, I mean, as I'm not, they I'm not House of Jack talking about walking out of the... Wait, yeah. what? I'm not talking about walking out of the theater. I'm yeah. just talking about like, I got what I needed out of this experience. Mm-hmm. Like, I got, you I got, got that scared. Little- <laughs> I'm okay. I've been scared. I got scared for like three yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah. I controlled the situation. I don't need to experience the rest of this. I would argue that you're probably going to be scared in that movie for maybe a, an a, a cumulative 20 minutes. But then the rest of the time, it's just going to be a really cool and weird ass movie. Mm. So that's what like I the see. last the last real uh, like scary movie mm-hmm. I guess that I watched was uh, the Netflix one, The Ritual. I think it was called. And it's not really a scary movie. Mm. It was more like yeah. a monster movie yeah, yeah. kind of. Hmm. I thought that was really good. I enjoyed that. But that was enough for me. Uh, think, uh, like, that'll do it. American Psycho. It's the only movie that, that really scares me. Yeah. Well, that's really? I don't know if it's actually happening or not. Yeah. <laughs> Have don't you know. read that book? I don't know by if the anybody way. sees that movie the same way I see it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I've, 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 I've read, read Brett East, Easton Ellis's yeah. book. Yeah, I, yeah. I haven't That's read terrifying. the book. Yes. I, but I've read again. I've read. I read. Like, I was. Well, I was that reading. He's allowed a, to like walk around. Like, yeah, I was reading a that? thing about <laughs> about like movies that didn't include like uh, worse parts of the books and there's oh yeah well the, the book is very weird on a lot of levels there but what did you read there specifically there's uh uh like the rat torture oh, yeah, in well, the, well yeah, in, the oh, book. yeah. In, in the book in the book he just <laughs> we don't have to describe well, we, we, we these things on we, the podcast. we absolutely will not but yeah in the book all the killings are uh, for the most part just extended torture killings that mm-hmm. involve like 25 different stages of torture described yeah. in meticulous detail. It's pretty fun. Like, like, keeping... But that's in the midst of, we don't even see a killing in the book till like halfway through. The rest of it is describing like scenes of people getting dinner and business meetings yeah. and stuff and every single character who's met is described head to toe in terms of exactly what and who like they're, what wearing brand they're wearing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's an assessment of all that and that's mainly what the book is. There's yeah. hard cuts where he's just describing his favorite music of the time too. He's mm-hmm. like, well, I'm listening to this because of this. And you're like, what the fuck mm-hmm. is going on? Yep. <laughs> that's weird. It's incredible. Yeah, there's a lot of weird media out there and I kind of dig it. Yeah. I kind of really dig it. Mm-hmm. Guys, yeah. I, have to, I have to go do fitness. It would be that right would now? be a fun book to, go right to oh, audio really book. Oh, to read. It's a bit of a slog because you can only describe so many fucking Gucci suit and whatever, whatever. Shoes but listening to it makes more on. sense. Listen to it would have a propulsion to it. Yeah, yes. fair enough. All right, mm-hmm. Chase, you have to go. Right, I have to leave. Chase. All right, well, Holy crap. good luck at your fitness, dude. Yes. I'll see you at the airport tomorrow Pre, morning. Pre-water pools of fitness All at right. Chase five hundred four. <laughs> and if. Uh, if you don't hear from me again, it's because Wadapalooza got me. That's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you see Chase there, say hi. All right. So as far as um, as far as far taking a turn into the weird, mm. this is okay that Chase has left because now Chase actually- Now we can start talking shit about him nonstop. He didn't watch True Detective. He didn't get a chance oh, to watch okay. it, is what he said. Mm-hmm. I can finally just look in one direction. There this is go. way easier mm-hmm. than on your constantly neck. turning 180 degrees back and forth. It's easier on that neck of yours. Um, on that fat ass neck of mine. So, all right. First blush impression. I'm assuming you guys watched both of the yes, new episodes. Yes, watched True, mm-hmm. yep. True Detective, season three. Let's get it. I fucking loved these two episodes. I also loved the episodes. I'm enjoying it. Uh, amazing. Yeah. I think from the fucking start of the title mm-hmm. sequence, I was like, Season one vibes, yeah, hardcore season one vibes, and then it, it started, no doubt like, in the title sequence more. they worked very hard to induce exactly that, uh, exactly worked that very feeling. hard to induce these, those uh, season one vibes, and also yes, as we get into the episode, they're very much going back to the uh, way of telling the story that was very much present in season one, where you have multiple time, well not yeah, multiple timelines. We have a story taking place in multiple times, but. One upping that because now it's three, now it's three. different timelines mm-hmm. there. So a story taking place simultaneously in three different times, all informing upon each other and all that. And woohoo, yay! It's fun times. There's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, I mean, just looking at, for me, I got a lot of joy not just from the content itself, yep. but from the technical execution yes. of that storytelling. Yes. Yep. It was. It's so fucking impressive. Yes. Well, it's so just just to kind of break it down on a few different levels here, real quick, just to kind of knock them out. Just 
not even visually, but just specifically photographically, it was really, really impressive, an impressive movie. And it just one, it like it, it kind of utilized uh, just some. They're always kind of pushing the vanguard on like new, expensive, fancy ass lenses that can have these incredibly crystal clear uh, 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 focus with these incredibly narrow sh- depth of field effects that are kind of popular. Like the first episode of. Um, of a uh, 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 handmaiden's tale used it effectively. Mm-hmm. I never watched the rest of that series, but uh, and it's like you just see that all it was so photographically. It's just very beautiful. The old age makeup on him is out holy rageous. Yep, 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 rehearsal, yep. all he's acting yes, by the way. Yes. Oh, he's incredible. He's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And so just just on a technical level, it's just like it's so meticulously executed. Just on in terms of its textures, you're just sort of like already like okay. I'm, I want this to be good because I want to continue to enjoy watching this. And then beyond that, it automatically starts throwing out the problems that season two had, which is why I checked out, which is it gives me genuinely uh, genuinely uh, eerie and genuinely intriguing narrative turns in both the first and second episode that both make me want to tune in next week, but also make the mind explode with possibilities. Because that was the wonderful thing. And then, why season one was it got into the whole uncanny horror thing, a la H.P. Lovecraft, etc. Is it just explodes your mind possi- with spot with possibilities? I don't know what this show could be. And in spoilers here, moving on, I guess should we just get into spoil? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, just the territory when they reveal at the end of of the uh, first episode that the one of the two girls who was kidnapped is the still boy, alive. The boy. Yeah, the boys, sorry, the, the, the boys killed. The boys the killed, but the girl is still alive. Yeah. Oh yeah, it reveals that she's uh, her finger. That she's still alive as an adult. Um, and that, but no one's seen her for the past ten years or whatever the thing is. Uh, oh my God! What story could yeah. be behind there? Well, immediately it just immediately it's the type of device that immediately makes your mind explode with possibilities. Like, was she kidnapped? Was she in uh, this? Was she brainwashed? What was the thing? And they've know? also done very much in this uh, a little bit of a Twin Peaks thing, mm-hmm. just because that's the best reference I have or touch point I have for this, wherein. Yeah. In the first two episodes, uh, which is a, basically a two-hour movie, and the premiere for uh, Twin Peaks was also a two-hour movie, yep. they've introduced you know, an intriguing dead body. We're all going after cops searching, a uh, good pair of cops we have searching for this, uh, the, 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 uh, the solution to this one mystery, and giving us a panoply of about 900 different people who could have killed the kid. Or kidnap the kid. They've given all. They've thrown everything in the kitchen sink at every possible, you know, set of suspects everywhere in every crack and crevice of every scene. There, the, it could what, be anyone from the parents, either of the parents of the kids, maybe could be the teenagers the uncle, who are obviously doing. Yeah. yeah, the uncle is an obvious one. Yep. The weird Indian guy who probably won't be the killer, but maybe who knows? Uh, yes. Yeah, there's there's so much depth to it, and and. One of the things that I liked about the first season is it felt as if it was well constructed, yep. right? It was it was put together from here's the crazy ass finale yeah. that I know I want to get to, mm-hmm. and how am I going to how am I going to tell a story yep. that's coherent across these different timelines? And that's why this feels it feels coherent like yep. season two lacked that coherence yep. it, it just felt like you know pieces being thrown against the wall just for the just for the factor of like oh his, his balls were shot off and his eyes are out of his yeah, head yeah, it's yeah. like okay who gives a fuck like that never came up again yeah, yeah yeah i'm you know and that's one of the things worth mentioning uh is i'm just trying desperately to google it what is the name of the series of documentaries that were made about those three kids who were falsely accused because uh, of killing a kid in that small town. Peter Jackson produced... Yeah, the Peter produced, Jackson produced documentaries. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, it's absolutely killing me. Um, uh, sorry, but anyway, point being that there was a series of documentaries that was done, and it's yeah. basically set amid the satanic panic Is of, it the Errol, uh, Errol Morris documentary? Errol Morris was not involved, um, but these are... And I'm just, it's absolutely killing me, and I can't think of the name. It's a really good title, too. Um, but Peter Jackson, I think, produced the last of them. I think there were four of them. But the basic gist of it was, in some small town, some kid is brutally murdered. And this happened in real life, I mean. Uh, was brutally murdered in a forest. And then three kids in the town, by virtue of the fact they that... Shall they shall not grow old? No. No, that that's, a, the that's, that's the new one. That's the new Peter Jackson produced uh, World War One documentary. Uh, yeah. yeah, I know. I know it's, it's tricky. I'm trying to think of anything to Google. Um, uh, anyway, but the point being that... 
it's a famous case just because three kids, by virtue of the fact that they dressed in black and like listened to heavy metal or whatever, uh, Paradise well, Lost. Paradise Lost. Um, uh, maybe that was the Wait, last one. It's no, not. The, it's west of. It's uh, west of Memphis. The West Memphis. Er, west of Memphis. Or, yeah. It's a New Zealand American documentary film directly and co-written by Amy Berg, produced by Peter Jackson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. I think that oh, was okay, one okay. of the. There's been a few. Okay. Documentaries. So there have been. Yeah. Paradise Lost is a, made by different folks. About same the story. Same, right? same story. Yeah. Yep. And it's a three-part thing going all through the years. It's making a murderer before making a murderer. Yes. Exists. Exactly. It's about the West Memphis Three. The West yes, Memphis West Three. Memphis there you go. Three, so, that's and that's it. what I was trying to get. The West Memphis. Mem- the West Memphis Three. And so they were accused, and the whole thing is obviously is, is that like because it was amid the satanic panic, it was amid this world where you're being told that like these new kids are getting into all sorts of stuff, and they're killing, uh, they're like killing animals, and they're going to kill your kids as part of their satanic rituals. Which, as absurd as that sounds now, is of course was actually part of the cultural zeitgeist at the time. Oh. And you see, just to wrap up this idea real quick. The three kids in the Volkswagen, you know, who are dressed in stuff, and you who who, and it's literally the second it cut to that shot, I turned to Cliff and I said, I didn't, I couldn't remember the title, but I said, oh shit, is this? They're just doing the West Memphis Three. Is that what well, this he, season well, here's is? Here's the thing: is I thought when you said that, yeah. to explain, it, I was like, yes, yes, that seems that's what it will be. But then, as the two episodes yes, unfold precisely. there, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. It's just, that's just one of the possibilities. Yes, yeah. So doing the whole West Memphis Three, these kids are falsely accused of whatever, spend time in jail and eventually get exonerated, uh, satanic, whatever. That's just one of the possible yeah. many, many plot threads, yeah. all of which have interesting directions to go. By the way, speaking on the satanic panic thing, very fun watch for anyone with the internet and YouTube there, but to look up D. Snyder's testimony before Congress Fuck yes. Yes. is quite awesome. Awesome there, just because you get a sense of the bizarre cultural atmosphere it was in which the things that they were afraid that were influencing kids were satanic stuff and S and M. S and M imagery with, with whips and stuff like that was something that was terrible that we need to keep away from our kids. Yeah. It was corrupting our kids. That you know, Congress was getting involved to prevent kids from seeing this. Well, it's, it was led, like, of course, by Tipper Gore and Al Gore, yes. who was featured. He gets this back and forth, the D. Snyder and Al Gore, which is really precious. Which, by the really way, if precious. you just want to remember, if you want to be reminded what a fucking asshole Al Gore was, before, you know, like before he decided all of a sudden that he was going to save the environment, just watch that testimony uh, because you'll, you'll you'll get a sense of it pretty quickly. I just watched it the other day. Um, anyway. But the West Memphis Three thing, you watch the thing, you, I saw the three kids, clearly they're making a, an allusion to that, and they, which is then confirmed a scene later when one of the kids is sitting on some bleachers and Stephen Dorff, and by the way, Stephen Dorff! Amazing. Amazing, Ooh, yeah. yeah. Doing the whole good old boy Southern well, it's guy like he's thing got a whole, really fucking well. He's got this like a whole new chapter of his career is going to open up based on this. Anyway, but he he's, goes... And he's he, the McConaughey of this story. Yes, or he's he's the Woody Harrelson of this story, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the point being, he sees a kid in a Black Sabbath t-shirt that has a 666 on, and he's like, <laughs> what's this Black Sabbath? What's this Satan stuff? And they're setting... And the fact that he reacts that way to those things is kind of just helping set that stage for the fact that, like, yeah... At that at that time in 1980, people thought that like this is a problem. We, like like kids vaping today, it was like we have to do something about the encroachment of Satanism and S and M sex on our youth. That's going to corrupt our youth. Yeah, and you I know? think I think one of the things I enjoyed most about these first two episodes is how sort of self aware and referential the story is, while not seeming to be entirely derivative of just these like storylines. Mm-hmm. It's the West Memphis Three references in there. Yeah. The idea of like these true crime documentaries yep. is in there, right? Because his his like 2015 mm-hmm. version is participating in this true crime documentary. Yep. Memento is in there yeah, with yeah. him like leaving himself audio notes. Here's today's date. Here's why these people are here. Mm-hmm. Don't talk to them about anything else. Yep. And then you know the uh, uh, the Yellow King is mm-hmm. even kind of referenced in the dolls. Like there's a little bit of like this feel oh, yeah. of like but that same sort of the same, same sort of vibe. like weird like Bayou you know yeah. backwoods Yellow King thing There's going the on. The idea of like witchcraft, culty horror, that sort of thing again, which was a nice, pleasant return this season to to incorporating some of that because that was so much of what made the first season of uh, True Detective so fun. Is like you, it's like they they made some references that made you think uh i don't know what even genre i'm in like yeah. is this going to go is this going to become full out horror is it not you just didn't know because true detective wasn't a concept yet you know and it was revealing itself to you over the course of that season and so 
you know, and again, it's it's now I think we have a better sense of what true detective is, but we still don't know really what this story is about at all. And I, I absolutely love that. But I have a theory. I do have a theory about how the three different timelines relate to each other. Um, and, and I just think that this is how it's going to play out, which is basically what, one thing I really love is the idea that it's clearly about this old, old version of can't pronounce it. What is his, what's his name? Mahershala Ali. Mahershala Ali. Uh, as Wayne an old man Hayes. who is having memory problems, <laughs> he is having trouble remembering things. And he's basically saying that his interview, which he's conducting as an old man, is helping remind him of things. And they even have these tense scenes with the family. And I love how it's so grounded from his perspective as well. I love that idea that people seem to be just getting irrationally angry with him when he's asking questions and he's confused by this but doesn't understand why, you know, Know, and but it never addresses it and I think it's just the subjective experience of someone whose memory is failing who has like forgotten that so and so is doing music in LA yeah, or whatever his daughter things. has moved to LA exactly and even that during that dinner scene he yeah. asked the same question multiple, multiple times, times and you can see his see son getting more exasperated, and more exasperated. And get up and leaves and you just like you're inside his experience and so what I love is that as we what I really like about it is it gives the intercutting between these three different timelines a diegetic basis, which is a basis in story, which is we are seeing the fragmentary nature of him recalling these memories. He's recalling things that happened in 1990 and then recalling things that happened in 1980 before that um, and how they all relate to each other and kind of echo through time. And what, so my theory essentially is, and I don't think this is, I think this will probably very quickly based on the, t- the how the very last beat of episode two ends ended that he in the present day through line in the um in the uh the old man version of him is going to finally start putting together something about this case very much like matthew mcconaughey did uh very start putting together something about this case that he never put together before some unsolved aspect something they got wrong the first time around and but it's going to occur to him by virtue of multiple layers of memories waking back up and revealing to him connections that he didn't realize were there so his brain will begin to wake back up again he'll start making connections again and somehow all three timelines will come together in some sort of present day resol- final resolution to this issue um, and and the other thing is it just creates these amazing parallels like you have in you know in 1980 in where we are he's frantically looking for this girl uh, this this girl who's gone missing you know it's a missing child I've got to find her even though we know she's alive that's still suspenseful because in present day, He's frantically looking. They're frantically going to start looking for the same girl. We know she's 10 years older now. We know she's a woman at this point. We don't know why she's gone. So he's also frantically looking for the same girl. But the one thing we haven't really ever seen is seen her or heard one word from her. So I think it's, I know, it's, it's setting up a really cool, solid, interpretable, awesome narrative dynamic that I can't wait to see play out. Like, I can't wait to see this same dynamic applied to the next episode, the next episode, the next episode. I love it. So, it was really good. Yeah, I think the um, the the fact that it's also just a really sort of well-paced mystery is mm-hmm. is adding to the to the fact, like, mm-hmm. to the enjoyment of it, yeah. right? Just the, the process through which they go mm-hmm. to different people's homes and they talk and each conversation sort of kind of illuminates something about mm-hmm. e- the each individual involved. And you start asking these questions like in the middle of the second episode, I, I was like, I was trying to figure out, I was like, man, we haven't seen old man Steven Dorf yet. Yep. That's going to be mm-hmm. fucking awesome. Can't mm-hmm. wait until he pops back yeah. in. One vibe you mentioning all the various conversations, people going to different places. One, one thing that is very much a part of the true detective <laughs> DNA, the true detective style here is that every single conversation, I guess it's emerging across all three seasons, Mm -hmm. every single conversation, no matter how urgent the circumstances are, everyone is very, very, very chill and very, very open to talking about whatever in whatever circumstances. Yeah, except this time, as opposed to in season one, like they're actually talking about stuff that's interesting enough that we'll listen, but in a context where we're hanging on every word they're saying, which like four episodes in five episodes into season two they still had not established like already like they and i I love that they're doing those like when you think about true detective season one what do you think about you think about long conversations in the front seat of that car between woody harrelson and matthew mcconaughey and they're already delivering 
you know, it's hard to think of two people who are as compelling as that. But there is just a mysterious quality about um, Ali's performance that is just very intriguing to watch. And whenever he's talking in the car and he's laying out like his here his rules for hunting things. Oh, let's talk about his character's backstory. Oh my god! Oh my it god! It was the coolest. It was yeah, the yeah. cool. Like you know, every every action movie, yeah, yeah. every mystery has to have like yeah, the yeah. the protagonist that has uh-huh. like the awesome super badass yep. background. And yep. when the guy mentioned his background, when like that moment happened where they set him up as a lurk, yeah, yeah. I was like, I I it was I was watching it with Katie yeah, and yeah. Giannis and Kelly, and I was like, this is the coolest fucking setup yeah, yeah, yeah. for like a badass main guy yep. I've heard in a long time. Yeah, no, it's absolutely. Absolutely great. I just love so the idea is he's this was he was this guy who even other Vietnam vets uh, who in the 1980 through line, you know, were surrounded by guys who have just gotten back from Vietnam. But even they hold him in a higher regard because he was this lurk or whatever they called him. So he's dropped behind enemy lines and to do reconnaissance and then has to fight his way back through the jungle. And so and I love that they saved revealing that till the end I guess it was of episode one when all everyone goes wandering to search the woods in one direction and he turns around and just walks the other direction and he's just looking at the and you just get the sense he's they're basically establishing him as a modern day analog to the idea of the western Indian tracker who can see things in the landscape that other people can't see like the man like uh, in uh, 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 Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid he can track a man across any terrain and that's oh, like literally uh, referred to him in the Vietnam stories sent off into the mm-hmm woods forever long and he brings back scalps mm-hmm. yeah he, he I said he brings back scalps. T- that's a good point i didn't think about in that vietnam yeah. for two years and he spent most of that alone yeah right and then he also has that moment where it's not it it if you re i i for me it's fresh because we just watched him last night yeah, so, yeah. so so did we yeah. uh, the the tracker portion of him mm-hmm. isn't thrown out out of the blue it's mm-hmm. it's present in the entire of the first episode mm-hmm. especially in the beginning like one of the first conversations he's having with his partner his partner's like i don't understand how you eat boar mm-hmm. like why would you eat boar i never want to eat boar and it's like that doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. in that context yeah, yeah but when you come back to it after having yep. watched both those first two yep. episodes he he mentions when he's talking to the girl he's like I hunt boar. Yeah. Like this is, I or, go and I track boar yeah. on my own and I hunt it down. And even Stephen Dorff had mentions it like, I think mentions it in that speech about his Vietnam thing saying like at this point he just, he track, he can track anything. He just tracks boars for fun, you know, or whatever the thing is. And that's just a cool concept for a dude, you know, in a, into for a dude in a show, make him that, if you're going to have a dude in a show, make him that dude. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Um, no, but I love that. And it has a really, and again, I just, uh, there's another thing I just have to respect about the writing of uh, in episode one and two is it has a great way of really utilizing the multiple timelines dynamic in an interest in a way that draws you in. So it'll tease something in like in in a future dynamic that doesn't seem to be part of the story in the past. So that then when that thing arrives, it feels doubly satisfying because it makes this connection between the past self and the present self. For instance, he starts breaking down crying when his wife is brought up, you know, and then it's and then it's mentioned that his wife is like this author uh, who uh, who has written this this classic of literary nonfiction Um and uh, and and he starts crying and like that's kind of an odd detail for his life the fact that his wife is some sort of famous author and then a few scenes later you know they uh, a few scenes later he meets a teacher who's like reading poetry from a book and they kind of have a chemistry and a lesser show a lesser show and by lesser show I mean many other shows would have first introduced us to that character so we saw the beginning where it begins and then later on would have made allusions to the fact that they were married or whatever but by inverting that and it does this many times this way Bird Box actually has a similar di- because Bird Box if, if you haven't seen it has a present day through line and a past through line and it actually does some similar things to um, to do that so uh, credit to Bird Box but by just putting it in that order it's so much more delicious because the moment you see her you immediately form a hypothesis the moment you see this teacher and she's reading I'm like I wonder if that's the wife who's the author look at how literary she is and then and then and then a <laughs> well, second later when it's good and they have a dynamic you're like oh th- this must be the wife and it makes that scene so much more 
more satisfying because you have this 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 thing in the chamber that's loaded that you're waiting for it to be confirmed. And so you feel when you when the when the audience gets to make connections on their own, they feel smarter and they feel like the movie is pull like the the movie is richer when they're making those connections and they're not spoon fed to them. And I think that's what's so wonderful about that. Oh yeah, what well, actually what another very small thing, but uh, on on the level of the having the audience put together things on their own and feel super smart even though in retrospect it's pretty obvious is all the investigation in the kids roods there mm-hmm. finding the Playboy magazines yeah. and then find this little pinhole there yeah. and they see all these things and then in a later conversation about an uncle that may have visited there an uncle stayed, stayed, in, that uncle stayed in the couch yep. oh no the son slept on the couch he stayed in that room yep. the detectives change a look and it's like okay and you understand yep. the full narrative of all that never having been told it it's yep. just seeing a few bits of evidence hearing some other facts in a conversation yep. an exchange of glances that's it the mm-hmm. the foreshadowing that they're able to do by playing around with the current timeline uh, like the 2015 mm-hmm. old man version and sort of what you learn of what's ha- happening in that timeline mm-hmm. I think is is really interesting to me because like there's a there's a moment where uh, when he ends that the interview the first time mm-hmm. and he goes into like it looks like his wife's study his mm-hmm. wife's old study and there's just copies of her book and he mm-hmm. picks up the book and there's a very brief shot of the cover and the title of the book mm-hmm. and the title of the book is like, under the harvest moon which yeah, is like a life a death thing. of the harvest moon yeah. it's uh, and then the subtitle is uh a mur- the murder kidnap the murder and the kidnapping and the city it tore apart mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that alone it's like oh wait what like yeah, yeah. like what how's just, it gonna tear the city, how's apart? It gonna tear the city apart and mm-hmm. then when at near the end of that second episode when the da sort of like announces mm-hmm. hey you know we have these these clues and this is the neighborhood we think that yeah, this yeah. is going on in. It's like, oh, you just fucking turned everyone against each other. Yeah. Like you just you just turned the paranoia to eleven right yeah, there. Yeah. And uh it's just so interesting that even just a few scenes before that, yep. it's just hinted at. It's like a split second. Yeah. If you're not trying to read the title of that book, you'll never see it. And then yep. suddenly it kind of starts making sense. Like that storyline starts sussing out. I just love, by the way, that whole that whole sequence where they're talking to like the DA or the mayor or something, you know, whoever the like, whoever the uh, the man is, and they're explaining like, let's you know, a slightly underhanded way of just how do we get into all these houses as fast as we can so that we can get the girl. And the DA is like, that won't hold up at trial. And, Martin, and they're like, this is not about the trial. Like, like the and, constituents. Yes, exactly. But but it's not even that. But he's just like, this is not about the thing. It's about the it's about the girl. You know, it's not about the trial. It's not because it's about how do we get to the girl fast, even. Doesn't like and I and it's a dynamic I've never even really seen in a um at, or at least explicated in a cop movie before, which is like it doesn't matter if he goes free. It's like we're just trying to get the girl back and we'll worry about that later. Um, that priority and then how subtly they just set up this dynamic of, you know, like the Jaws dynamic of like the the sheriff who's trying to get the job done and the mayor who has other things in mind when they do the exact opposite of what they asked them to do and they put it it just it was just a really well written scene that managed to play into that Jaws evil mayor thing but may do it in a very grounded and surprisingly fresh feeling way so that that dynamic is established but it doesn't feel like it's been forced onto the thing i so. also very much feel that the character of wayne hayes mahershal ali's character yep. is is truly interesting mm-hmm. and it there's a couple reasons why one is like the the narrative aspect of mm-hmm. you you don't necessarily know if you can trust like there's parts of it you can trust like the you can trust what's going on in the like whatever's being mm-hmm. uh uh you know secondarily confirmed by other surrounding characters you know that you can trust it but because it's from his perspective and because you know that he's mm-hmm. you know on at least in early stages of dementia yeah, yeah. you can't necessarily believe everything that's going on well, you that, have to that's li- what I'm wondering lean into it. I'm wondering how much of the stuff we see from the past is in any way accurate or if you're going to play a little more into that I can almost guarantee you that there's going to be some moment where Mahersha Ali uh, the present day version of him the old man version of him is probably going to formulate some big theory and it's going to come to a head and he's going to say like why aren't you people listening to me and they're like don't you remember like that guy died three years ago and therefore couldn't have blah 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 mm-hmm. blah, blah and there will be some huge gap in his memory yep. that explodes well, he, his theory that throws us into momentary like is he just crazy and then he'll will eventually well I know what right. it is I know what it is yeah. the thing is uh, the kids won't in fact have been uh, disappeared on uh, the day Steve McQueen died 
mm. throughout the day. He keeps referencing Steve McQueen died today. It was the day, Steve, today. McQueen was the day Steve McQueen died. I remember from 35 years ago. It was the day Steve McQueen died. Uh. And it'll turn out that it won't be that. That's just my prediction for an easy interesting. one. Interesting, 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 interesting. The other aspect I think that makes it so interesting and and really like sucks you into to caring about what's going on mm-hmm. is the technical side of like little things. Like when he's talking to the uh, the interviewer, the producer, and he's mm-hmm. giving this story about I didn't go to bed that night. Like I went, everyone else went to bed that night, and I went hunting that mm-hmm. night. And he's, it's showing him in 1980 walking through, seeing the bike tracks, yep. seeing the puddle, the reflection of the moon yep. in the puddle, and then the moon goes out. Yep. And he looks up and he goes, do I stop talking? Do you yeah, need yeah, me to yeah. stop? And then it cuts mm-hmm. back. You're like, wait, I don't understand. Like uh, that, in that yeah. moment, you're like, what the fuck just it's happened? Like we, are, we, are, we are not seeing reality. We're seeing past. his, We're seeing exactly. His, yeah, his yep. memories of it, including his imaginations of it. So his imaginations of when the kids in the Volkswagen saw the kids in the bikes driving past, that they had ominous looks in their face. Yep. That's his imagination, and that yeah, happens and twice. Oh, yeah. The second time was when he's in the. I think it's when he's in the house. He's in the the yeah. Indian guy's house, and his partner leaves, and he kind of turns to the camera almost, uh-huh. and he says, "All right, I'm I'm ready. I'm like oh, I'm does, done." Yeah, he does oh, that he multiple does times. times. Multiple it's times. It's just like times, yeah. it's, it's, I'm just talking about the, even where it's not specifically referenced. I'm talking about like the reality that we're seeing there in those past things is not accurate reality. It's his, his, it's his perception yeah, of it, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Or it's, yeah. his, it's his recalled memory from 35 years Which later. we cannot trust. Yeah. Which I think that a pretty easy nugget, since he mentioned Steve McQueen died this day, uh, like 900 mm-hmm. times yeah. it'll be. Uh, actually, no. Steve McQueen died like, you know, three months before or something uh, like interesting. that. Interesting. Yeah. So I don't really know exactly where this is going to go, and I like that. Yes. You know? It's nice. I'm okay with the possibility of this sort of mirroring the first mm-hmm. season of True Detective. But my my gut tells me mm-hmm. that what's going to end up happening is the first half or so of the season mm-hmm. is going to lead you in the direction of thinking it's going to be mm-hmm. mirroring, like, you know, going to be some sort of cosmic entity, evil yeah, yeah. entity that's being mm-hmm. served. <laughs> and then about two-thirds of the way through the season, it's going gonna, it's gonna to flip on its head. And you're going to realize, oh, there's something else completely yeah. different going on here. I think there'll be a variation on cosmic entity, quote-unquote cosmic entity, but I think the cosmic entity will be entirely mental and entirely subjective. Much yep. as it was in season one, but also here, we're dealing with a reality which isn't real. We're dealing partly with, uh, there have been many movies where part of the movie or the whole movie is a dream. And you can yep. have super grand supernatural things that are horrifying pop up in there because it's not real reality but it reflects true psychological reality which I think is going to be to factor in an old man with memory fading recalling blah blah well blah. the other thing by the way and this is potentially going to be a thing um, is I think that a lot of it will I think a lot of what is maybe comes in the latter parts of the season will involve uh, the revelation that uh, that um, Wayne Hayes is that the name of the character. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wayne Hayes is not a good guy because, and the reason I say that is he's is, is which one's Wayne Hayes? The he's main, the main guy. character. Oh, um, the, char- oh the, the character's name. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. Um, I think that in that there's that interesting scene that definitely stands out in this scene because. We we like the dynamic of uh, of the cops breaking the rules when they're defying the the, the mayor or whomever it were DA who was concerned about his constituency. But it also gives us the other side of that coin, which is them just dragging some guy out of a diner and tying him up in a barn and kicking the shit out of him. And we know for a fact. Uh, for, that they reference in the 1990 uh, through line that they got the wrong guy in 1980. And it appears that those the Stephen Dorff and Wayne Hayes have no problem beating the shit out of someone and just, you know, and just telling them that they're going to, you know, send him up the river, yada, yada. They, In fact, I think it ended with them throwing him in the trunk and we never really got resolution on that thing. Um, and I think it would be an interesting thing if it were slowly revealed as, as memories come back, you know, and maybe some guilt comes back that we realize that maybe 1980 uh, Wayne Hayes maybe did some very bad things and wanted someone to go down for it. And maybe he's the one who sends one of the satanic kids to prison for 10 years, or maybe he's one of the, the ones who does something that colors everything else in a very bad way and i'm assuming that I, I have a feeling that's coming at some point over the course of the thing because clearly he's very cool but based on just that one scene where they're just beating the shit out of that guy he is not mm-hmm. a nice man well i'm predicting it's probably the indian guy who's gonna get in prison in 1980 mm-hmm. just because the wife's book which was written you know before later revelations called harvest moon and the whatever i yeah. thought it was the dad 
What? The dad? I think it's the dad that gets uh, wrongfully yeah, convicted. Possibly, possibly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I guess one of the things that just struck me was what information we're learning from which memories mm-hmm. and how much we can trust it, mm-hmm. right? And I think, you know, the, one of the big twists at the end of that first episode is realizing from during the deposition that they found her mm-hmm. prints, that she's still alive. Yeah, yeah. But that's never referenced in either of the other like even in the even in the 2015 mm-hmm. timeline they never even talk about the fact that she she was still alive they just talk about the story that's being told mm-hmm. and that there's still an uh, an open case here that there's still some sort of unsolved mystery and i think it's it's the, i mean maybe i'm just being like way too in depth in whatever details there are but there's definitely enough there and there's one of the things i like about it is that you can just sort of look at it and see like all right well I'm just going to discount this entire part of the mm-hmm. story. Like who knows what's actually happening here. But if we're looking at his perspective mm-hmm. and it's not being confirmed by any other characters, mm-hmm. and it's not being talked about by any, any other characters. You can, you can almost say, well, I'm just not going to believe this part of the story mm-hmm. until it's confirmed yep. just because of the, the, the narrator, right? You can't really necessarily trust that, that the protagonist, yeah, I think. No. No, I'm, yeah, I'm with you. I'm very curious to see how this dynamic plays out. But I, I now take a counter position to Cliff on this, which is I'm going to assume that um, that everything that we see in the past through lines will be more or less true, but that will be revealed. But what we do and do not know will be determined by sort of revelation and omission of certain bits of content or certain things, more so than us explicitly seeing things and then finding out those things that we saw aren't in fact true i i i I, and that's just the vibe i get maybe i'm wrong but it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the course because if in fact the things we're seeing in the past didn't happen then that's a whole other dynamic and that'll be very interesting so well yeah what i find an interesting way to go with this is just a psychological exploration of the nature of subjective reality Mm -hmm. and of the time. faulty nature of memories mm-hmm. and time and all that uh, yeah. factoring into the narrative into how the mystery yeah, is ultimately yeah. it's not an accident it's not it's not an accident the poem that she's reading to the class when oh, he first walks in it's, it's called tell me a story oh yeah and she's reading uh the back half of this poem which is essentially um it's like about Uh, I mean, it's hard to say what exactly it's about. It's, it's a little vague, but Mm -hmm. the vibe from it, right. If you read into what it's trying to say, and I read it this morning and Mm -hmm. I read some Uh, interpretations of this morning is, is essentially the story of longing for a past that once was, mm -hmm. but not necessarily wanting to be told like they, they, the narrator is asking for a story and the story they're asking for is something that's going to delight them. That's going to give them a feeling of like homeliness and like you know feeling good about where they're at but not necessarily being reminded of what they're leaving and what they've been through and so i think the the concept of time and like the play of like he didn't want to get married and then he met this lady and then they did get married and she ended up being like this really successful writer and they had a bunch of kids but then one of the kids doesn't really like them prediction is that uh, my prediction here is that we're going to find out that the uh, the the death of the wife was not the end of their marriage, and that potentially at some point prior to that she left him, and that she has subsequently died, and he is very sad about that. But we're going to learn that she and that she left him maybe because of revelations about not nice things that he did yeah. or something like that. I think that. yeah, the 1990 timeline will the end result will be he'll be you know disgraced yeah. and stuff in some big form or fashion. They reference him leaving the departments and stuff yeah, after yeah, that yeah. too. Oh so. yeah, that's right. They said that he left the department yeah. after those things. And so yeah, that's my re- my thing is that it's going to be what I like is that it's not just a show that is intercutting between three timelines, but it appears to be a show that's showing you three t- three timelines as a way to represent the inside of the head of a man who is suffering from dementia and he is and knowing the show and basically some of the things I think that he is a man who is racked with guilt about the various not nice things that he has well, done. Well shit dude the last scene of that second episode well, that's what is I was amazing. Saying. Yeah, yeah no. that's exactly it. Remind me what was the last scene? It, the last scene is he just looks, shows up. Well he looks at a picture he's at dinner yeah. and he looks at a picture of his wife and then he like opens his eyes and yep. he's on the street in front yep. of the torn down house. Which is interesting on two levels. Oh, okay, which right, is interesting right. on two levels because on the one level, 
it looks like maybe he's found some sort of clue, some sort of revelation. He looks shocked, like he's figured something out. He's gone to the house. He's remembered something. But at the same time, he's an old man with dementia standing in his underwear on a street in the middle of night, and it just cuts there in a disorienting way. Hours us, after the previous making scene. Us, making us feel like he just woke up there. And so it's the thing where it's simultaneously, it could be either thing, It's it, and maybe I think it's both, which is him in fact, having a huge revelation, something he didn't realize before about the case and going to check it out, but also a crazy old man, as people with dementia are prone to do, just going wandering off into the night. So I thought it was a great way to end that episode. Yeah, I'm really yeah. looking forward to the next one, and uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed mm-hmm. that it keeps this momentum going yes, through, yes, through yes, at, yes. Least, at, I, least, at least the first half. Oh, yeah. And I also love that, unlike Netflix shows, which is the main competitor of HBO at this point, it is not all bingeable. Yes. We actually have to wait a week. Yep. It stays, stays part of the cultural conversation for a long time. I mean, we wouldn't be able you to hear do that this Netflix. Shit. You hear that Netflix? <laughs> Keep your shows part of the cultural conversation for 12 weeks as opposed yep. to a weekend when everyone binges the damn thing. Yep. Okay? Listen yeah. to me, Netflix. You son of a bitch. Anyway, let's go ahead and wrap it up right there, guys. That was a good one. Yeah, uh, I am at Mr. Kyle Bogart uh, on the most central Instagram account on the internet. And I am at Cliff Bogart on another Instagram account as well. And you can find me at Arm and Hammer TV. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching and listening. And uh, make sure to catch up with True Detective if you haven't already. Definitely watch the third episode. And we'll see you guys next week. Later. Later. Later.